Hello and welcome. I'm Kevin Frazier from Entertainment Tonight, and I'm so excited to be your host for the 2020 Youth Sports Summit presented by the LA84 Foundation and the Play Equity Fund. You know, traditionally the summit is a one night event where we all gather together in person, but as you all know, we live in very different times and a very different world now. So this year we are embracing the possibilities of doing this summit virtually over the next five weeks. We will bring you a series of conversations that revolve around our theme, People Power Our Movement. The Play Equity Fund was established by the LA84 Foundation to bring the transformational power of sports and play to children, regardless of their race, gender, zip code, or socioeconomic status. The issue of play equity was first addressed at the Youth Sports Summit years ago. Now those conversations gave launch to the Play Equity Fund to drive equal access for all kids to play. Basically, we're trying to level the playing field. You know, 2020 has been challenging for everybody in so many ways, but for the Play Equity Fund, it's also been a journey filled with incredible growth. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Play Equity Fund has teamed with the LA84 Foundation and collectively given out 120,000 play equipment products at 60 sites to young people to encourage activity and health. That's beautiful. And the Play Equity Fund has also responded to this historic moment in our country where people have taken to the streets to protest racial injustice and all the pro athletes and teams who are demanding change. Please welcome the president and CEO of the LA 84 Foundation and Play Equity Fund, Renata Simril, who will tell us more about the role the Play Equity Fund and LA 84 Foundation has taken in 2020 and give us some perspective for our Youth Sports Summit. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for joining us as this year's MC of the 2020 Youth Sports Summit. We are so grateful to have you with us and more importantly, grateful to have you as part of our Play Equity Movement. And thanks to each and every one of you joining us for the series of conversations at a most pivotal and timely moment in history. You know, I look forward to our Youth Sports Summits each and every year. It's a moment for us to take a pause and come together as a collective to hear from industry leaders, sports executives, athletes, teams, and leagues, to be informed and inspired, and to hear stories of how they're using their platform and their voices to drive social justice in communities who need it most. And this year's format, focused on a series of important and timely conversations over the next several weeks, is about how people power the movement. And with a wider audience, it will make this year's summit another memorable chapter of 2020. While it has been a challenging year, challenging to say the least, we've also seen many positives, including the Play Equity Fund's growth and some extraordinary partnerships with the Alliance, the 11 professional sports teams coming together to stand up social justice and to make sure that this moment, the deaths of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and others, so many others, doesn't go in vain and that we respond in a significant and meaningful and sustainable way. To our partnership with Angel City Football Club, the first women's football club soccer team here in Los Angeles. You know, together as partners, we're making sure that we stand up and speak for racial inequality and drive social justice and change, particularly for our youth where it matters most. And we continue to find and explore new ways with our partners to level the playing field so that sports and the transformational benefits and opportunities that sports brings are more accessible for all kids and for all communities. And we remain confident that together we can close the play equity gap. The events of 2020 have deepened our commitment to ensuring we continue to take a strong stand and new actions to stand up racial justice and inequality in communities who need it most. We are all part of this pivotal moment in history and sports figures throughout time have used their voices and platforms to support social justice issues. Perhaps at this moment, athletes have never before been more active in standing up for what they believe in. But if we wanna see real change, sustained change, we can't leave it to the athletes alone. We all have to be part of the change that we seek. And this first conversation with Jamil Hill moderating really demonstrates how and where we can get involved and be part of the solution. And it's fitting to kick off our Youth Sports Summit. So please enjoy the conversation uh, today. 
And don't forget to follow us on our social platforms, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Engage in the conversation and stay tuned for our next conversation around sport for social justice. Thanks so much, Renata. You know, no team can win without a great point guard, and your leadership is unmatched. So many athletes from so many leagues have taken a stand in recent months, especially in the NBA. So maybe the best place to start is by revisiting the Sports for Social Justice Symposium moderated by my good friend, Jamel Hill. You know, this conversation brought together Tim Harris of the Lakers, retired NFL player Michael Bennett, Revolve Impact CEO Michael De La Rocha, and Renata to explore how sports and athletes are using this important moment to raise awareness, drive investment and impact for social justice, and how sports figures have done so throughout history. So let's kick things off with that conversation you had with Jamel, Michael, Tim, and Mike. And by the way, it also provides us more insight on the Alliance Los Angeles and its goals. So we appreciate each and every one of you who are joining us for our very first conversation of the 2020 Summit, Sports for Social Justice, with Jamel Hill moderating. I am Jamel Hill. Um, last week, really big news, the 11 pro sports teams in Los Angeles united to form the Alliance Los Angeles, which is a collaboration to address racial injustice, advocate for social injustice, and support other issues important to Black communities. The Alliance is partnering with the Play Equity Fund in greater LA. So to understand what huge news that is, and also more about the context of this conversation we're about to have, I'm gonna bring in one of our speakers uh, for our panel, who will tell us a little bit more about the Alliance and some of the work that's being done. And with that, I'd love to introduce to you Renata Simbrel, who is the president and CEO of LA84 Foundation, and also the president of Play Equity Fund. So welcome, Renata, and please tell us more about the Alliance. Yeah, sure. And, and maybe, uh, Jamil, starting with, um, you know, Play Equity, um, we uh, at the L84 Foundation established the Play Equity Fund uh, about four years ago, and it really was to stand up um, injustices that existed in play. We believe that play is a fundamental human right that all kids can enjoy. Um, and so Play Equity means fairness. It means opportunity. Uh, it means that how much exercise kids get shouldn't be determined by their income, and that the dreams of our youth shouldn't be limited by their zip code. Um, and the, we know from our work at the L84 Foundation and the Play Equity Fund um, that play can transform kids' lives both on and off the field. When kids play, they're healthier, both physically and mentally, um, and they do better in school, but it requires access and opportunities. And the reality is that across this country, millions of kids don't have access um, across this country, as I said. And, and there are really a lot of reasons why. Um, one is policies that have lowered expectations and funding. Um, lack of underinvestment in enrichment programs, including uh, school sports and after school uh, programs, uh, coaches, tours, safe passages to parks. Uh, these are all hindrances to positive forms of activities and engagement that is essential for kids to thrive and critical uh, to their future success. And so um, you know, in response to the global protest over George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and so many other black uh, men and women who've lost their lives at the hands of police brutality. Uh, the 11 professional sports teams came together and, and while each of their philanthropies do incredible work and their community relations departments do incredible work and have in direct services and working with community organizations in communities of color, um, they all came together to say this moment demands more. Uh, it de it's requiring us to do more to really um, stand up to be allies in the black community uh, to speak to racial injustices and to find ways in which we can create uh, pathways to lifelong well-being um, for the kids in the communities that we serve, particularly Black communities. Now, as you just kind of laid out for us, that you all have been engaged in this work, even though what the Alliance is doing is a little bit newer for folks, but you guys have been engaged in this work for a while. So you've been through cycles where we've had the, the conversation. I want to ask you this before we get uh, to the rest of the panel. Why is this conversation being heard or being advanced so differently now than what you've seen as you've been doing this work? Yeah, sure. Right. You know, I tell people my mom lived, uh, I'm a third generation Angelino, and my mom lived through the 65 riots, and we'd have stories. And, you know, I live, uh, I lived through the 1992 civil unrest, and in fact, worked uh, for Mark Ridley Thomas rebuilding South Wales, Los Angeles. So, community organizing um, policies, uh, injustices, um, you know, dealing with those at the local uh, level. And I never thought in a million years that um, we would have protests of, of global 
proportions. Um, you know, in 2020, I have an 18 year old and a 13 year old son. And, you know, we often have that conversation when the police stop you, um, you know, make sure you know your rights, make sure you, you know, we call it code switch, um, you know, so that you make it home. And, um, you know, but through my experience, this is different because of the depths of the conversations people are having. Uh, we're talking about racism. Um, you know, we're educating people on Galewood, um, you know, Black Wall Street and, you know, how that was burnt down. We're talking about, I mean, did you ever imagine that the NFL would, um, you know, basically apologize for the for Colin Kaepernick, um, you know, taking a knee, um, you know, admitting that they were wrong in the sense of, you know, not standing up for Black Lives Matter. Um, and so I think the depths of the conversation, um, the engagement, um, you know, the listening uh, that a lot of my friends and colleagues and organizations are doing. Um, and I think um, that is a, a, a tribute to, I think, the 11 sports teams coming together and being part of those conversations. Um, you know, the, the empathy, uh, the commitment, um, and the willingness to listen, learn, and engage and be uh, engaged in this work over the long term. Um, I think is what's different and certainly what gives me hope um, being at this uh, work for quite some time now. Yeah, and speaking of that, along those same lines, um, we're going to get to uh, the rest of the panel and the discussion that we are about to have now that will hopefully add to all the discussions that we're having across the country and continue to advance not just the conversation, but also the action as well. Um, there have been a lot of people who've been at this work uh, for a long time, like yourself, and so uh, let me introduce the rest of our panel because they certainly fit the bill just like you do in terms of being committed and focused and driven to uh, continue to fight for social justice and for change. Um, in addition to Renata serving on the panel, we also have Tim Harris, who is the Chief Operating Officer and the President of Business Operations and Chief Marketing Officer for the Los Angeles Lakers. That's a long title, which means he probably makes a lot of money. Um, and we also have uh, Michael Bennett, who everyone owes a big congratulations and best wishes to because he just recently retired from a terrific career in the NFL. He also wrote a book that I guess if you guys are Zoom artists, you can see that is on my shelf called Things That Make White People Uncomfortable, which I love this title of this book because just the title will probably make white people uncomfortable. <laughs> but uh, Michael has been engaged in a lot of philanthropic work throughout his career. Uh, Definitely one of the players who not only stood up for Colin Kaepernick, but also engaged up his own form of protest um, during the NFL season. And so we're going to ask him about that, as well as other things involving the NFL's sudden change of heart. Uh, we also have Mike uh, De La Rocha, who is the founder and CEO of Revolve Impact, an award-winning social action and creative agency based in Los Angeles that works closely with athletes for impact. Um, and he's going to lead us uh, certainly on him when it comes to uh, how athletes have contributed to this movement, how they can educate and inform uh, and support social justice initiatives. So thank you all for joining uh, us this morning. I'm going to start with a very simple question that I'd love for everybody to give their thoughts on. And as you guys know, you're definitely free to engage with each other um, because we have a lot of great criti uh, critical thinkers on this panel. And I'm sure that you all will want to respond to some of the things that your fellow panelists say. But I will start us off with this very simple question. What is it about sports that makes it the perfect, um, the perfect platform for us to not just discuss social justice issues, but to advance them? And um, with that, I'll start with you, um, Michael Bennett. <laughs> um, I think what the purpose you mean like how do athletes play a role in that basically well just how with sports in general if you look at it it's been such a it's a unique platform because as much as we have heard loudly in the last few years about sticking to sports and how sports and politics shouldn't mix there's a long history there of sports politics um social injustice uh racial justice all of those things mixed together but what is it what i'm getting at is it uh, uh michael what is it about sports that makes these conversations like the ones that we are having today possible? What is it about this platform that is so powerful and allows us to use it as a change agent? I, th I think a lot of times athletes are, are seen as heroes. I think when we look at actual heroes that we see, like we can't really see Superman, Batman, all these different people, but it's like LeBron James is that person, you know, he's the Batman of the world. So it's like, 
athletes have this sense of more connection to their communities and this platform is is immense it's huge you know this is the only generation where we can reach billions of people with in a quick tweet or a text so really i think athletics is just something that people have always looked up to in a sense of like people see athletes and they notice that they can't do things that they can do especially when it comes to just human side of it like i can't jump as high as lebron james but i love watching him and when all of a sudden I'm not paying attention to the way that he jumps, but I'm paying into, attention to how he has connection to humanity, it starts to change the conversation because I feel like sports has always been like, always been this, this place where people felt like they couldn't talk about politics. It was always something, but the black athlete was always a black man. So it's always, and the woman was always a woman. So it was always these things that were happening in society and people wanted to to act like they weren't happening within sports, but to take the opportunity to talk about them in sports and have this big audience, it just allows us to be able to reach a lot more people. And I think sports is a barrier breaker when we talk about race, when we talk about race and we talk about politics, we talk about religion, those opportunities there where we can bridge gaps. And I think when we look at the past and we look at all some of the greatest social movements in America, there have always been, athletes have always played some kind of role in it. And when we talk about um, Jack Johnson, we can talk about, we, we can keep going on and on. And, um, you know, John Carlos, and now we're looking at this generation where we have LeBron James, we have Colin Kaepernick, Maya Moore. And I think when we look at what they're doing and we look at their sacrifice, it, it makes us look at ourselves and say, oh, we look at this opportunity. We all love material. We all love these things. But this person is not worried about material. They love, we're more worried about the human um, condition. And we're more worried about the human dignity and the world about human humanity and connecting and not having more complacency. And I think when we look at athletes, sometimes we don't see them as those human beings, but having this opportunity to grow and keep moving and thinking about ways to reimagine what we can do within the sport is this is the generation to do it. And we know this is when we look at um, what we're doing with play equity and what they're doing around the world with athletes for, athletes for impact. We're looking at reimagining what athletes can do in their community and, and not just in a singular way where it's one person standing out, but looking at it away, away from a multifaceted all over it and having a, a connection between all athletes around the world. Uh, Tim, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I think that the great thing about sports is they tap into every emotion that we have. You know, you go to a big game and you feel every emotion within yourself. Happiness, sadness, joy, fear, stress. And in order for us to make any kind of movement in any, in any facet of the world, we need people to feel. You're not going to do until you feel. And when you combine what sports is, it's all about emotion. And you combine that with the megaphone and the platforms that sports teams and athletes have, and you put all that together, then you can start to begin to get critical mass when you start engaging with the public on things that are involved in sports, but stepping outside of sports. Uh, Renata, you have something to uh, add to that? Uh, or maybe not. Well, <laughs> I was, I uh, what about I, I was over here like, I know. I know you can't hear me. Like, See, no, I push mute. Uh, but no, you just like, mute. Okay. <laughs> you know, but listening okay. to Tim, Tim and Michael, you know, it, it, it hearkened to you know the last time the Dodgers were in the World Series, and I was saying is that sports brings communities together. Um, you know, you're you're rooting for a team. You know, I played sports all high school, and you know, it didn't matter that I was you know black or poor. You know, if I could you know dribble and you know get a pass, that I was on that team, and my team really you know, hung with me and, you know, hearkening back to the last uh, World Series games and this, uh, for the Dodgers, you know, I'm high-fiving people that I'd never met before. Um, you know, we're hugging, you know, when they win the game. And so I think the the ability to root for the same team um, and come together from a, for a common cause, you know, rooting the Lakers on for a championship or the Dodgers on for the World Series, you know, I think that power transcends off the court, off the field. Um, and I think that that is the tremendous power that sport has to bring communities together. And to Michael's point, the platform that it affords um, to reach such vast audiences um, in, in, in engaging them uh, in, you know, work off the field, um, you know, like the Alliance and, and Play Equity Fund is going to engage in is, I think, um, you know, why sport is such an important part of our collective tissue. 
and uh, Mike De La Rocha, I'll, I'll give you the floor to chime in last. Well, I think everything has been said, but one thing I will say is from an interpersonal level, I think sports has been a way where I've made some of my uh, longest relationships. Uh, the ability to be in community with folks that I probably wouldn't be without sports um, is something very huge because that's breaking down perceptions and barriers that we may have with each other. So that's why I'm very grateful to be in, in community with the Lions and play equity fund because you can't underestimate the power of sports to bring people together, but also create a safe space for us to have dialogue just by being in near proximity to each other. And so to me, sports is a powerful vehicle for understanding and moving folks, uh, you know, in places they've never even thought of before. Now, um, Renata already hinted at this earlier when we were discussing the Alliance and what it, some of the aims um, in terms of that will do in advancing all the things that we're talking about now. But Tim, I'd like for you to kind of further expand on what she said and um, discuss what's the strategy of the Alliance. Um, certainly there's a lot of uh, issues and a lot of terrain to cover. So what's the strategy behind it? Well, I think the goal is first, first uh, I'd, be remiss, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Tom Penn. Tom's the president of LAFC and, and he's the one out to us on a, on a Sunday afternoon to all the 10 other team presidents in the marketplace that said, we need to get a call and we need to figure out what more we can do. Uh, we know we're all going to individually do, but what can we do together as a collective? And last week we announced that. We announced the formation of the Alliance. But, you know, and Renata and I have discussed this at length. We haven't done anything yet. Early, you know, We've put our team together, but we haven't played any games, so to speak. Um, but thing that, what I like about announcing the alliance is that it, it has put us all on the clock. It has, it, it, it's, it's announced that we intend to do, and we are on the clock. But I say that in that if, if everyone is not figuring out that they're also on the clock, then they're a little bit late already. Uh, but what this provides us is it provides us with a chance to reframe this into something even broader. Um, now, I, I love sports. I love what sports provide. I love that they offer a chance to build leadership, and teamwork, understand teamwork, you know, understand what it's like to have a setback and then come back from it. And for any, any child who has a dream to be the next Braun or the next Michael Bennett, I'm all for it. I'm all in on that. And, and sports has the responsibility to provide an equity of opportunity for kids from community of color to have that chance to play professionally, to be the next LeBron or to be the next Michael Bennett. But as I said, there's also, we need to broaden this discussion. We need to make it a bigger discussion. And what we have to do is we have to start showing communities of color the roadmap that that their kids can have to work in sports. You know, we, we need to explain to the mother of a, of a young, you know, seven or eight year old black child that there is a roadmap for your child to one day sell sponsorships for the Dodgers or be the CFO for the Angels. And here is that roadmap. And because the reality is, is you know, there's 11 teams in Los Angeles and that's a lot of teams there's certainly a lot of athletes running around, but there's many more folks who are working in sports than there are in athletes. If you, if you consider 11 teams, that's what, just for the teams alone, that's 2,500 jobs. And then if you add the stadiums and the arenas, and then if you add colleges, okay, but expanding just beyond how do we provide equity to the communities of color to play is just part of it we have to also show the equity of opportunity to those communities to work. And so the goal, the goal of this would be complete and true equity across the board, not just playing. Well, Tim, you hit on something uh, really important um, because as you might imagine in my line of work, probably just like yours, uh, being a sports journalist, that's not a career that a lot of kids necessarily consider when they think about some of the things that they can do in sports. Um, uh, Renata, I know this is an issue that's important to you. 
as well. And uh, Michael Bennett, um, we all had like kind of a side off air discussion before about um, exposing kids to these various careers um, that are in sports that don't involve them necessarily playing. Um, Renata and Michael, I'd love for you guys to address this is what are some strategies or ways that kids and people and young people in general can just become exposed to the fact that there are a lot of different careers that they can consider in sports and what that looks like for them. Um, Go ahead, Michael. You hear me? Yeah, hear me? Hey, Michael. Yep, we got you. Oh, my bad. No, I actually think that when we think about equity and we think about all these um, ideas, it's like we have to be able to involve so many people. So I would say like having like a small group of kids and people from the community come in and ask them what they want. And I think it's important to have that because the internships allows them to be able to get into the room and figure out who they are and what they want to love. And I think having diversity from all levels of sports is important because it's not just okay for them to see just, you know, athletes on the field, but to see them in these classrooms. And I think um, building some type of bridge to allow them to, you know, you know, just learn in these rooms is, is an important space. And I think, like I said, I just believe that being able to actually sit down with the kids and being able to sit down with the parents and ask them, what do you really want for your kids and how do you see your kids being a part of this and where, what area do you see them loving and do they have oppor ample opportunity to, you know, just venture and see what they would really want to like. Because I feel like as an athlete, sometimes you don't really know what you like because you've always been pointing in a certain direction. So allowing them to kind of just grow as individuals and really figure out where the impact is, whether it's, you know, wanting to be the CFO, wanting to be if you're a chef and you actually want to be a nutritionist and understanding how athletes' bodies work is, a, is an important process. Yeah, Jamil, Jamil it's, um, it's intentionality. Um, there are still thousands of kids, you know, who haven't been outside their neighborhood, you know, live in Southern California, never been to the beach. So to Tim's point, it's, it's access and opportunities, not just in terms of being able to play sport or be on a team, but access and opportunities to career paths. Uh, you know, I use, um, you know, myself as an example, my mom was a grocery cook and my dad was a butcher. Um, and that was all that I saw in my neighborhood, working class, um, you know, communities. And I knew I didn't want to be a butcher or grocery clerk, but I didn't know what other opportunities were out there for me to pursue. I didn't know, to Michael's point, you know, what I was good at and how that translated into, you know, study in college or a career. And so a big um, focus of the alliance is, um, you know, engaging kids um, around um, leadership and being able to teach them the skills to speak up for themselves, um, you know, to create agency, if you will, <clears throat> um, to advocate for, for change and, and, and to be able to seek those opportunities and then to be able to, um, you know, take, take those opportunities full on. Um, and then being able to take all 11 teams and be able to bring, uh, you know, the young kids to a stadium, uh, you know, to be able to meet Tim Harris and say, what was your path to get from where you are or from where you were to where you are? You know, being able to meet journalists, people in PR. Um, so then the kids can say, wow, you know, I'm interested in math. I didn't know I could be a statistician for the Dodgers or, you know, I'm interested in, um, you know, how, you know, people play the sport. I didn't know I could be a scout and that's a career. So a big part of the alliance is engaging um, youth through sport, um, providing them with the leadership skills, you know, how to navigate a corporate environment, how to navigate a sports team environment, and then connecting them to those opportunities and then staying with those young people over a five-year period of time so that we can really track the progress, you know, making sure that the kids um, in the programs that we're going to be investing in, you know, that they get through high school graduation and then on to college um, and then working with other organizations while they're in college to make sure you know, five years from now, we look back and we see kids um, pr pr pursuing careers in sport, um, you know, pursuing opportunities that are going to help them change the circumstances that they find them in, um, you know, in poor communities. So that's that's a big goal of the uh, of the alliance is making sure that we're changing communities one kid at a time. Uh, Tim earlier said uh, something that kind of stayed with me. He said, you know, we're on the clock and discussing the alliance and the initiatives. And as you just you know, uh, the phrase that I think is a key phrase as, as you all continue to, to set the intention. Um, there's so many different conversations happening at once. Everybody's in the mode of, you know, we want to do something and you all have sat on, I'm sure a number of these panels, especially over the last two months, where there's been a lot of discussion and a lot of talk. Um, Mike De La Rocha, I want to come to you on this. With all the talk, all these intention setting, how do we go from that to um, not only just the action part of it, but more importantly, holding ourselves accountable in this moment for the things that we're trying to institute. Hmm. 
Well, first, I just want to. Uh, Huey Newton once said that the that we are not changing unless the world is changed, and I want to really center and give gratitude to the three Black women who started Black Lives Matter, uh, mm -hmm. Colors, Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, because of their work, we are having these really frank, honest conversations about race and power. And to put it in context, I was looking at yesterday just about what has happened um, since we saw the brutal lynching uh, in Minneapolis. And to put it in context, anywhere between 15 to 26 million people in the United States have participated in almost 5,000 protests, making Black Lives Matter the largest uh, movement in the United States history. And so right now, in terms of accountability, I think there's multiple things. I think on the sport side, it's critically important to look at what is the makeup of our board and positions of power within our sports teams and leagues. Michael often kind of talks about the fact that there is not, you know, a single person of color that owns a team, for example, in the NFL. Um, how do we look at those things? And I think, I think, uh, I always look at things in three kind of lights. One is what can I do myself? What can I do on a cultural front? And what can I do on a, on a policy front? And on the personal front, I think it's important for me specifically as a, a white passing Chicano, um, how do I understand my own privileges that I gain from this culture that we live in that, that invests in, in values white lives more than other lives, for example? So what's my own internal kind of practice of deconstructing whiteness, deconstructing anti-Blackness, all of this stuff? On the cultural front, I think it's incredibly important that so many so many sports teams and companies have had these statements in support of the movement for Black Lives. It's important for us to be in collaboration and making sure that they live up to those words and that there is action behind that. So I think social media, I think getting involved is critically important. And then obviously on the policy front, I think there's policies within sports and there's policies within government. And I think, you know, local democracies where all the change happens, how do we continue to be involved in efforts like the Alliance or efforts like local city and government, where we can make these words manifest in real changes in people's lives. Well, um, it, along these same lines, as we discuss accountability, um, we just saw the NFL meet Roger Goodell, who, um, you know, I think it's fair to say he certainly hadn't been supportive of the player protest and until a few months ago had never said the words Black Lives Matter. Just an example of a number of people and entities and corporations who were not really a part of this movement before, but suddenly want to be a part of it. And their track record hasn't necessarily lined up with some of the things that they are saying now. So um, Michael Bennett, as somebody who just retired from the NFL and realized people, when I say just retired, I don't even know if the the ink on your retirement papers are actually dry yet. So this is just, you just announced this in within the last 48 hours. But when you saw Roger Goodell uh, apologize to the players for not listening, and he didn't say Colin Kaepernick's name, but I guess some people assume that Colin Kaepernick is a part of this group. Um, when you saw him apologize for not listening to the players, starting to engage the NFL in conversations, I mean, they're talking about wearing uh, decals on the helmets, of victims uh, that would represent victims of police brutality. There's discussions about them singing the Black National Anthem before the week one games. Uh, the Washington football team, it looks like it's inevitable that they will finally change uh, their mascot, the racist mascot name. You see the NFL engaging in all these acts and gestures to try to prove that they are trying to be on the right side of history. How should we, um, Michael, how should we view them being late to the party? Um, and, you know, are they, should they, do they deserve the benefit of the doubt, despite the fact that they've been kind of sitting out this fight up until now? Um, I think it's hypocrisy. Um, and I think when we look at the NFL and we look at all the things that are happening, we look at some of these leagues, it's, it's important to determine what, what is symbolism and what is real action? And I think a lot of times we're looking at a lot of people who do a lot of symbols, but the symbols don't really turn into yeah. structural change or change what's happening to people around the world. And I, we look at a lot of the leagues and a lot of businesses in America. Um, they have they have benefited from the exploitation of 
poor people around the country, and especially black people, when we look at the NFL, if you look at the history of basketball uh, and the NFL, we see that the African American people have played a, a pivotal role in the in the change of the sport and also in the production and also in the capital side of we look at how business has changed over the last 10 years of the NBA and the NFL it is it's exploded when we talk about marketing and we talk about Twitter we talk about the ability to sell jerseys and ability to capitalize on TV deals we know that black lives matter because we can look at the capital and we can look at the capital gain and say well black lives matter because look at the way the amount of jerseys that LeBron James sells look at the amount of jerseys that Odell Beckham sells we know that black lives matter but do we know that black humanity matters. And I think that's the thing that we're trying to really understand with these leagues and understand. And I think it's really hard to be, to be, to judge because it's hard to say, well, just cancel them because of that. But then at that point, we don't allow people to have the opportunity to grow. We don't have the opportunity to make change a real great change. So I don't want to say cancel them, but I do say we have to have discernment and really understand what is the motive behind this. Is it to show that you're not racist or is it to show that you really want change? And I think that's that still has to play because I think, like Renata said, is that's a five-year thing because honestly, we won't know until five years to say that the people stick to the plan. Was it really that they really were part of the moment or were they part of the movement? And I think that's the thing where we're really trying to determine um, over this years. And I think the NFL, um, the players, I think the thing that we miss it when we talk about sports is that the individual has always been a part of the struggle, but the teams have have always been a part of the struggle. And so this is a new. This is a new space. It's a great space because we've never known the teams to be like, oh, we're a part of this. We have never known companies to be a part of the struggle the way that they're saying that they mm-hmm. are. So this is all new for everybody. And I think if you ask anybody from the civil rights movement to the ni- in the 1960s, they wouldn't say that, you know, that Apple would have joined them or Ford would have joined the, the racial, you know, equity movement. So this is a very hard thing to really kind of say, this is where it's going. But I think overall, it has a lot to do with the players and the players and the people within the companies and really trying to change um, this, this things that's been going on for so long. So like I said, I don't really know. And I don't want to be a person to say, oh, I want to cap them and cut them off at the leg and be a part of the cancel culture. Cause I don't want to be a part of the cancel culture. I want to allow Roger Goodell to have the opportunity because I think that's a part of what Martin Luther King and a part of what, you know, civility is it's the ability to allow humans to grow and be able to, you know, change their mind and be able to allow people to be in a space. But if we live in a space where every time somebody doesn't disagree with us, we cancel them off and we don't allow them to have the opportunity to truly build that bridge, then we are we are truly acting like the POTUS of the United States at this moment. And I think we can't really revert back into our animalistic side. We have to consciously stay on that moral line and be able to, you know, bring people along and understand that there's going to be some people who disagree because they haven't had our experiences. And I think the teams haven't had much experiences in these communities. So now that they're trying to have these experiences, I think there's opportunity for the ownership and presidents and the, um, and the players and the, the rest of the organization to have the opportunity to really make a uh, substantial change in these communities around the world. You know, Jamal, you know, I think um, it's incumbent upon us all to hold the NFL and uh, corporate brands and sports teams made, you know, slogans and, and statements um, and, and, Make sure that they take action. Um, I knew that the alliance was a was was moving in a different direction when I read a Sunday piece from LZ Christian where Tim Harris was quoted as saying, you know, that we don't want this to be about owning the press conference. We don't want this to be about uh, a logo or a mark. We want this to be about true action. So I think as it relates to the NFL um, or any other organization taking a stand for this moment, to Michael's point. The proof is in the pudding. You know, if we're still standing for Black Lives Matter and still in the struggle to change systems um, and to direct resources into the communities um, who deserve them, um, I think that is the mark of um, commitment. So we all have to hold each other accountable uh, for that action and for that commitment in the communities who need it most. And Mike, I think maybe from your perspective and how long that takes, um, you know, you had a pretty good big announcement with Maya Moore in terms of the time period of her work on criminal justice. Right, I mean, you know, to give um, all the respect and love to Maya as arguably one of the, if not the uh, most decorated female basketball player of all time at the height of her career, 
she took a step back to really focus on an issue that was near and dear to her heart, which was the power and role of prosecutors, and in particular, a family friend, Jonathan Iron, who was wrongfully convicted and spent 23 years in a cage in Jefferson City, Missouri. And she, for four to five years, learned and educated herself and got connected to folks closest to this issue. And Jonathan uh, walked out a free person a few weeks ago. And I think for me, when I hear this conversation, it's the process itself has to be different if we're going to live up to our values. And those that are closest to the pain have to be intimately involved in any kind of committee, any kind of uh, alliance, anything, because if we're going to shift power, we have to relinquish power. And we have to learn how to share and be in community and proximity with those that actually have the solutions. They've just never been given the opportunity to put those into play, to put those into scale. And so for me, uh, Maya is a great example of someone that did the work, became educated, partnered with those that have done this and dedicated their lives to doing this and resulted for not just freedom for uh, Jonathan, but really freedom for his entire family and shows that if we do commit uh, to working together, that we can accomplish a lot of great things. Um, you know, we we're talking about now with the brands and, and what teams and, and organizations need to do to continue, not just the conversation, but to hold themselves accountable and what that accountability looks like for them um, uh, along those same lines, but sort of slight, uh, slightly switching focus here. Um, Renata, what do, what is needed or demanded from the public in this moment? Like what, what do we need from them? Huh, it's a great question. Tim, I'd be interested in your perspectives on this as well. Um, you know, I think to be, to listen um, and to be informed, um, you know, by what we mean by social justice and the injustices that we're battling. And I find that in the conversations I've been having over the last several months is, you know, people don't realize um, the injustices that have been perpetuated on Black communities in particular, but minority communities across the board. You know, 59% graduation rate from high school. You know, black males are two and a half times more likely to get suspended for school. Um, poor communities have five times um, higher high school dropout rates than kids from more affluent com communities. You know, the obesity rate in black and brown communities in LAUSD alone is 48 percent. That we own the juvenile incarceration rate. We own the criminal justice rate. We own the homeless rate. You know, with the lowest home ownership rate. Every dollar of wealth that white households have, black families have 10 cents. Latino families, 12 cents. So when we talk about social justice, when we talk about system changes, you know, I think simply being educated and informed of what we're trying to change and why we're trying to change and the importance of it, you know, I think is a fundamental place to start. Um, and then I think second is get engaged. Um, make this moment matter. Um, you know, it's not enough to just be, um, you know, anti-racist. You need to be an ally in the black and brown community and find ways to, you know, get active and get engaged and stay with it because, you know, um, it's taken us a long time to get this point. It's going to take us a long time to get out of this point. Um, but we all have a responsibility to do something. So whatever that something is, get educated about it and get after it. Yeah, I, would just, I think I would dovetail onto that and just, you know, we're going to, we need folks committed. We need them invested and we need them invested and committed for the long run. Um, you know, you and I have talked, Renata, that it took us 400 years to get here. Yeah. From, a, from, this, from that standpoint, Team America is on a 400-year losing streak. Okay, mm -hmm. so Team America is not going to win a championship in the next year. Okay, Team America has to get their lineup together and get their game plan together and get a new playbook. And the thing that concerns me a little bit is if the pandemic taught us anything, that we are looking connected to each other okay and what what, we, what we're seeing you know as we there's a lesson we can learn from the pandemic and that we can take it to this cause and, and and that is we're going we're going to need leadership from the top down but we're also going to need investment from the bottom up we're going to need societal discipline we're, we're all going to have to participate you know if if 50 percent of us give 100 percent and 50% of us give 25%, Team America is still going to have a losing streak. Okay, so when you ask what can the public do, 
you know, Renata, educate, learn, lean in. Look in the mirror and ask yourself hard questions. Look back at that, that image looking in the mirror and ask the tough questions. But we have to, this is a long time. A 400 year losing streak, Michael knows. 400 year losing streaks are tough to come out of. Yeah. Right? We're going to have to do the hard work over a long period. Um, yeah, I mean, you were going to say something, uh, Michael? Yeah, I think America has like a strange connection to liberation, right? In the sense of like, when we talk about liberating people and giving people the opportunity to move forward, and I think it's hard for Amer Americans and human beings to really reconcile with a lot of the pain that's happened to human beings has been done by human hands. And I think the real issue, we look at Mother Earth and we're like, oh, well, it's a tornado and this is, but it's really us doing violence to us. And I think it's important that we realize that the only change comes when we have a sense of compassion and empathy for other people who are not having the opportunity. And as Tim said, 400 years, that's just that's just one part of the sect of the pain that's been happening to Americans, especially Black people and Indigenous people um, in this country. And I think um, we really have to look in the mirror and really have to dig deep into our own own sense, right? Because we've been so segregated in the sense that we always say, well, that person doesn't have anything to do with what's happening in my life. And we had the opportunity to link the luxury of oppression in America. Like, well, black people had it worse than Mexicans. And then this, but it really comes down to everybody's had it pretty bad in America at this point. And because, in the words of, remember the Tiger? What team? What team? It's coming. It's coming down to that. It's like hey, black tears one time, Reggie. So it's coming down to that. It's like we we've been on the team, but there's there's no working components in the sense of the connection between the different Americas. And the different Americas have so many different masks, and there's so many different caste systems in America. And until we realize that, you know, these titles and things don't really make us human beings. It's really the blood and the DNA that runs deep into all of our souls. And to think that from and from a human point is that everybody wants the same thing in America. Everybody wants to be able to have their children go to a fair school, to be able to have clean water, to be able to have spare housing. And we live in, we still live in a place where we talk about going to build colonies on space, but still we have starving people on this planet. You know what I'm saying? So it's like we have a long way to go. And by these organizations and us coming together, this is one of the steps to say, look, Here's sport. Sport has always been a capitalistic thing. It's always been based on numbers. It's always been based on sales. But now these sports teams are saying, well, we, we're also going to have a sense of compassion and morality. So that's a big step when you think about that America is a capitalistic mindset and built on the sense of materialism and having these trophies matter. But we're talking about having a trophy of life. It really changes the conversation. And I agree with Tim. We have a we, it won't happen in a year, it won't happen in two years, but there's there's hope because if if you think about it from the perspective, if, if I was to think that my ancestor that was on, on the plantation was saying, well, there's not going to be any hope and I'm just going to stop and I'm going to give up, then I don't think we would be where we're at because they knew that there would be a better or brighter future. And I think that because we look at the society, we look at the amount of things that would be a progress with technology, but we look at society, we're still dealing with the same issues, still dealing with race and gender and religious. We're still dealing with LGBTQ issues in the 21st century. So these issues that were happening back then are still happening now. And now we, we have it. And I would say the playbook has changed. Now we have to fight these new plays to think about how to change this. Yeah, Jamel, Jamel, I, Jamel, I think listening to Michael talk, um, you know, in the formation of the alliance is about the 11 teams coming together for the greater good. And when you think about it for a moment, the Lakers and the Clippers, the Angels and the Dodgers, the Galaxy and LAFC. I mean, you know, deep crosstown rivals, competitors on the field have, for the first time in history, to my mind, living in, in, in Southern California, have put those rivalries aside to come together for a common cause. Um, and that common cause is to you know, help to change the injustices, to stand up racism, and to drive resources in communities who need them most. And I think that's what Michael's reflecting in terms of there's more that binds us than divides us. And if we can focus on the common good and how we all have a role to play and how we can all take part in making things better in communities that have been disenfranchised for years, you know, I think that is another attribute to the power of sport. And when we come together, how great things can happen. It's a great model for the rest of us, that's for sure. And that kind of gets back to what we talked about earlier about how sports 
is in a very unique position to bring together a lot of people. If uh, you think about what we do as a society, sports is one of the few things we actually all watch together and all do and, and commit together uh, to. So it's like, uh, it seems to be perfectly positioned to take us um, to kind of whatever is the next step as we figure out how we can continue, how we can solve, um, you know, uh, these inequitable problems that have been prevalent in our society for way too long. Along that, uh, along those same lines, um, Mike De La Rocha, I mean, we're in this great space now where we're talking, um, developing action plans, figuring out um, strategies. How do we keep this momentum going? Yeah, I mean, I just want to, I guess, first start by just saying what, what what's resonating with me now is just the the importance of knowing, like, if we study movement and study history, it all started fundamentally with a relationship. And um, I think to Renata's point, um, we started asking for impact, for example, four years ago to model what the Alliance was doing because there wasn't a space for Michael Bennett to be in community with the Maya Moore or with the Layla Ali or others. And, and to the credit, I just want to say thank you to Tim and Renata. One of the first phone calls was to Afi for Impact because we realized that we are stronger together when we recognize that our liberation is bound with each other's livelihood. Mm -hmm. And being like to keep the momentum going, I think it was stated like, how do we educate ourselves? How do we continue to be in proximity with those closest to pain? How do we not start new things, but fortify things that have existed for a long time so that we're we're shifting again this issue of power and privilege. And you know, I'm I'm really excited because um, the momentum has not stopped. If anything, continue to see uh, folks despite um, risks of their own livelihood and lives because of the pandemic, knowing that I need to, if I'm able to, I need to stand up for those that cannot. And I think uh, efforts like the Alliance, efforts like Athletes for Impact are showing that together united and and, ha and, and and not to Tim to your point earlier not backing away from the hard conversation but leaning into it and, and recognizing that this is not uh, a call out thing this is about us becoming better as human beings us understanding that what I've given uh, as a cis life and male is at the expense of others because of the way our society is structured. And what role do I have to step back in times where I may want to step forward? Because there's a way for all of us to share in creating a new world that we're literally doing in real time right now, whether it's in sports, whether it's in politics, we're literally creating something that our ancestors had dreamed about, like Michael was talking about generations ago. And so I'm, I'm just, I, I want to say that I love Michael Bennett <laughs> and I love love we both love in everything that we do we will be bound to make mistakes in the past. And it all starts with that authentic relationships that we can get through sports and we can get through organizing and we can get through true community building. You know, I'd, I'd like, if I could, Jamal, I'd just like to add, you know, I think one way, you know, to, to Michael's point, how we keep momentum going is we show sincere hope. We we show sincere hope. If you think about it and and, and you know, I said to Renata at the very start, I am not interested in doing this with the 10 other teams. If, if the goal is to win the press conference, create a, a logo, have a slogan, and pat ourselves on the back, uh, if, if we're going to do something real, then we're all in. And what we've not yet done and what we need to do is we need to go into communities of color and, and stop acting so paternalistic. Hmm. If you think of how we have, we have acted in sports teams, you know, we're one, okay? We've gone into these communities and we, we've said, we have, we have what you want. We are where you want to be and therefore we're going to provide you with this, okay? And it's been incredibly paternalistic, but we've never gone in and asked any questions and listened to their answers. We've never gone in and, and said, what do you truly need? And reality, like I'm, I'm all on board for more courts and more fields and more rinks and more baseball diamonds. But I think they really only make an impact if those those fields and courts and rinks are used after a day of true equity. That's when they're really appreciated. Other than that, when we arrive 
into these communities and provide a court and then leave. It just continues our paternalistic ways. And so we need to go in and that's great. We need to start asking questions. What do you need? How can we support you? And I think in doing so, that will provide them with some hope. And you're asking, how do we keep momentum going? That's how I think we can start creating and keeping momentum. And I think, Jamel, if just to add on to that, it's also to Michael's point, underscore, 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 there are a lot of many organizations that have been on the front line of this work for decades. And so don't, I think to, to Tim's point, don't come in with a paternalistic attitude and certainly don't come in thinking you're going to create something new. Um, so you can reach out to any one of us on, on this, on this um, panel and we'll direct you where you want to have an impact, be it voter registration, be it juvenile justice or criminal justice reform, be it immigrants' rights issues. Um, you know, you've got Community Coalition for Substance Abuse, Brotherhood Crusade, Social Justice Learning Institute, Social Justice Institute, uh, Liberty Hill. So there are organizations that need resources um, that have made tremendous impact and progress in fighting for, you know, to eradicate racism, fighting for injustices and system changes. And if going back to the question of you know what you can do is get smart about who's engaged in that work and align with that partner and help stand that partner up. And then the other point that I was going to make on the play equity fund, you know, that's exactly what we did. And so Mike uh, and I with Athletes and Impact have been collaborating for the last three years because we know that the impact that we can have together um, is much in driving those resources toward a common goal are going to be much more effective than us, you know, trying to do our own thing. And the play equity fund is precisely stood up um, to, to really stand up the ecosystem of sport-based youth development, to stand up sport for social justice, and to really work with all of those organizations and to take the resources we've got, we have coming in through the Play Equity Fund and distribute those to those organizations who have been doing this work on the ground for decades. Um, so that's just another point that you know, I think is really important for the audience to take away, um, is that you can engage uh, with organizations to help drive that impact. Well, in speaking of the audience, uh, we have quite a few audience questions uh, for the panel. Can so, I say something too? Oh, well, yeah, you can have one more thing. Because I, I, I agree with so I, I agree with Tim on the being able to have those conversations. Kind of what I was kind of hitting at earlier too is that you got to be able to make them feel like they have an investment. Yeah. Like if you're coming from a, a, a place of where you have all the answers, like you said, it just makes it doesn't feel real. And to me, when you build more fields, it kind of is just it builds to me it's another plantation type of idea, it's another pipeline. It's like if you build a basketball court, there could be one player that can eventually be in the NBA. So it's almost like you you planting planting a seed that can grow, but when you actually give them the opportunity, it doesn't seem like you're exploiting them. And I think it's important that we stay away from the, the sense that making people feel like they're being exploited, but they sense that like as Tim said, make them feel like they have real hope. And I think um, piggybacking on what Nada and what Mike said, I think too, when we look at um, athletes having an impact in, and I feel, and we have this conversation all the time about athletes for impact, there's a lot of athletes who want to make an impact but think they have to recreate the wheel. And as Nada said, there's so many people out there doing work and there's so many athletes, if they're you know, hooked up with the right person, they could, that could be a power couple, you know, that could be <laughs> the Dwayne and Wade and LeBron James coming down the lane for the alley you because when you connect somebody with their passion, it just allows them to grow and, and shine the light in a different way. And we saw the way that Maya Moore was able to, you know, be connected and find a sense of purpose and making something happen at a high level and changing somebody's life. I think that's what athletes really want to do in this century. Well, uh, to some degree, that does kind of tie in um, with the question that we've that we received from an audience member. Um, because for Maya, that was a life-changing experience for her to be able to free somebody from prison and to become engaged in um, you know, activism and, and at the local level in terms of local government, as, as Mike was discussing earlier. So uh, one of our audience members has this particular question um, that you all should answer, uh, which is, uh, this is from Julie. Um, what was the moment person or time that helped you understand social justice? Uh, Renata, I guess I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in my office and on the wall is a uh, picture of John Carlos and Tommy Smith in 1968. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I'm a huge Olympic um, fan. Um, and not necessarily for the sports sake, 
stories behind it. And so when you listen to the, learn about that story, when I learned about that story and, um, you know, they were both kicked out of the athletes village immediately um, and their careers were over. Uh, and I had the great fortune of meeting both John Carlos and Tommy Smith, um, you know, John Carlos through athletes for impact. Um, and I asked them both on separate occasions, the questions is you basically gave up your livelihood for that moment to stand up for human rights, uh, for the for black struggle in America, you know, would you do it over again? And they both said unequivocally, no, is that we all have a moment um, when we have to stand up and speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Whatever that cost is, we have to do it. Um, and, you know, I was able to scratch some pennies and actually get that uh, autographed uh, photo photograph that sits in my office as a reminder that we all have a responsibility to stand up uh, and speak. Um, no matter what that cost is. And so I'd say it was when I learned, and I was in high school, uh, when I learned about the 60 protest. I, I, say, um, I have to acknowledge uh, my parents. Um, I learned a lot from my father as an immigrant from Mexico, and uh, he was a dark skinned man that came to Boyle Heights in Los Angeles. And uh, the Chicano movement transformed him and my family. And uh, I owe an amount of gratitude to him for, for showing me um, and modeling how people of color were always in a struggle and in a movement for liberation for all of humanity. And so I also want to acknowledge his birthday is on Saturday. And uh, he's been away from me physically uh, for five years. Uh, but he's someone that I talk to every day in a spiritual world, but I just want to say I love my father so very much for instilling in me the values of, of, of justice and compassion and love and uh, for sacrificing so much. And I think when we talk about movements, the West wants us to think about these big individual, oftentimes male leaders, but movements are made up of people. People have created these systems and people are going to transform these systems. So I just want to acknowledge every single person that's done anything to advance this historic moment in time because we all play a fundamental role, whether it be small or big, it's all connected. And so I just want to bless my, my papa, if you will. I'll go. Um, you know, I, I've worked for the Lakers for, for my basically my entire career. Uh, I've been at Staples Center the entire time, uh, all the championship. And and I was I was in this environment where I was with these amazing black athletes and these amazing black individuals, and we were winning championships. And I I was going along, and I was thinking that I was a good citizen because I was non-racist. And then when I saw what happened to George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, learning all that I didn't know and all that I was unaware of, and how horribly I'd been sitting on the fence, hmm. how undereducated I was and how, how I was, I was leading a team and leading them in a way in the most non-racist ways possible. And it's, it's humbling and it's embarrassing. And yet I'm trying to use it as a way to push myself forward to try and, and be better and do better. Um, because I realized that I was, I was only half assing it. Yeah. What about uh, you, Michael? Um, was there a moment that changed or enhanced how you felt about social justice? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many, I mean, cause for me, I grew up in my, Parents went to historically black colleges and always went to NAACP camps as a kid. So I kind of knew like the story and what was happening over time that was really instilled in us in an early age growing up in Louisiana. But um, James Bird and, and um, the, what happened with James Bird in Texas, that kind of changed my life as far as being mm -hmm. able to feel, feel like I never felt like a sense of fear, like being inside of my skin when as a young kid until that really happened, you know, when I felt like, you know, like, like, dang, like I can just die. Like I can just be gone from the earth and nobody would even care, you know? 
Like they would have a, they would have like a, they would have like a, a press conference maybe if I was famous enough, and maybe Jesse Jackson would come. But it was just like, it just this sense of like when he died, it just felt like so surreal for me because I just I was in Texas and I was like, what if I'm walking down the street? So that was one of the things that kind of changed me early on in, in my life. It was kind of just like really seeing what could happen as an African American person and for somebody who motivated me i i grew up loving everything that muhammad ali stood for and then where how he took his role and i always said man like if i ever become an athlete um damn, man that's how i would want to do it i would want to like you know not be not be like you know not be a manchurian candidate but be a real human that was really connected to somebody and really connected to their communities and i never wanted to be like a person who had simple answers for something that was so complex and so people like him and and was somebody who really motivated me and as you said john carlos always motivated me and seeing what he was doing and you know everybody that, so just there's a lot of people and it's like everyday people that i see all the time in different communities that i may not know their names or know their story but i see their work and they motivate me all the time whenever i'm in back home in texas or just around but james bird was something that really kind of changed my whole life um, we do have a, a, another question for you that was uh, addressed to you specifically, uh, Michael. Um, this is from Cameron, uh, who's here in LA. What is a message to former peers about the urgency to get involved with youth to provide evidence that greatness is attainable? Oh, so greatness is just like one of those words that I don't know what the greatness is. I think um, opportunity is something that I really want to stress and understanding the voice that we each have and whatever that voice is. And I've said this on a couple of occasions, like not everybody can be LeBron James or Ryan Moore or Colin Kaepernick. Those are like super, 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 but we all can make small impacts. And I think as individuals, if Cameron can look at um, from a sports perspective is we haven't had the structure that we've needed to really make an impact on a global level that we have talked to me and Mike talk. I fantasize about this group that Mike was, it was creating something, you know, athletes for impact, and we're really having a sense of a red cross to where players can come in and kind of have that conversation and really make an impact. So I think um, being able to be, you know, get the knowledge and understand that there is a lot of um, places that they can make an impact. I don't know what greatness really is. I mean, if we talk in championships, I mean, you got to get great coaching, and I think great coaching starts from great um, organizers and finding great mentors, and I think. It's important as even all of us in high levels right now, all of us are doing great things, but I can say that everybody here probably has a mentor or somebody who can help them kind of, you know, figure out. And I think Cameron, I would say that, you know, those young people who want to attain greatness in whatever conversation or whatever place that they want to, genre they want to be in, they have to find great mentors to really show them along the way. Because I think sometimes as young people, they think they can, they are creating something new, but as it says in the Bible, in Ecclesiastic, nothing's, new under the sun. So it's important that we are able to connect and find great mentors. Mm, well said. Um, I'm going to try to fit in one more um, audience questions, even though uh, there were more to get to. So I apologize to all those who asked the question. And uh, because of time, unfortunately, I won't get to get to everybody. But uh, and I'll address this one to you, uh, Renata. Um, this is from Kathy. What would be an action plan for other communities who want to form something similar to the Alliance to make a difference? I'd uh, challenge all the sports teams in every major city uh, to get on a phone call or a Zoom call and, you know, replicate what we've done here in Los Angeles, both in terms of um, the, the length of commitment, uh, the financial resources and the team platform and assets, um, and then partner with an organization, you know, within that community that can help execute. Uh, and I think that was a critical element of the alliance and our partnership with the Play Equity Fund is we're going to be managing this initiative. So when the sports teams you know, resume when we get back to business as usual, um, th there's accountability for us to make sure we're executing on the strategy that we've developed. Um, and there are um, sport-based youth development organizations similar to the Play Equity Fund in Seattle and Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit. Um, I'm happy to connect anyone and everyone, um, you know, who wants to replicate what we're doing here in LA um, in another part of the country because there's millions of kids who are waiting for us um, to help them thrive. Um, and with that, I, I just want to remind the audience or tell the audience rather that this recording, it will be available on the Play Equity Fund website. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm sure anyone who watched 
uh, both as it was live and anyone who watches later will agree that this was an amazing conversation among some very smart people who have some, uh, not just incredible ideas, but ideas that they're planning into action and certainly are planting a seed, I hope, in all those who are watching and desire to be a part of this movement that we're in now. And as Mike said, not just the moment, but the entire movement, which means long and continuous work. One thing I like to remind people um, as somebody who likes to study uh, movements, because I'm a, a nerd like that, is that when you think about the Montgomery bus boycott, that lasted two years. And I know the way that it's shown in the movies, it seems like it was 10 minutes or just in a couple of days, they just decided that uh, there was going to be, um, uh, they were going to reach some level of accord with civil rights, but it took two years. And so this is not work that you can hop in and out of. It has to be long, continuous and, and ardent. Um, so as we close, uh, Renata, I'd like you to um, offer uh, a, a couple words for, um, you know, something I thought of it as we were talking. Um, there's a lot of people who look at sports and they don't want to see or be reminded of some of the problems that are in this world or to be reminded, frankly, that the athletes that they love, um, the backgrounds they come from, the, the social economic disadvantages that they may have suffered, they don't want to be reminded of who they are as entire people, just mostly as their entertainment. What would you say to those people who believe that sports has no place in this conversation and shouldn't be used as a platform for these kinds of issues? Wow, um, that's a loaded question, Jamel. Um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of um, Brian Stevens, uh, to say for us to really make this moment matter requires truth and reconciliation. And truth and reconciliation is uncomfortable. Um, but I don't think that we should look to manufacture equivalencies. You know, so when you say, you know, Black Lives Matter, well, my life matters. Well, that's not what we're saying. Um, so it's not an issue of, I think, you know, putting into your face and, and saying, look what you've done, look what you've done. It's really a moment for us to use the power of sport um, to come together around a common, common goal, um, you know, for the common good, um, to say, what can I do to make communities um, that I serve? Um, communities that I live in, communities that I work in, what can I do to make a difference? Um, and I think it was Mike that said it earlier. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a huge thing. It could just be mentoring a young kid. Um, it could be giving them an internship. Uh, it could be exposing them to a career opportunity that they never, you know, would have thought about, you know, otherwise. Um, so I think, you know, sport is is a great way for us to come together as a community. Um, and I think it's a great way for us to use the platform of the teams, of the fans of the athletes, um, you know, to come together to be the change that we want to see. Um, you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but, you know, if not sports, then where? Um, you know, if not now, then when? Um, we've been waiting for a long time to see change in communities and those system changes, um, you know, those, 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 <laughs> you know, we were having this conversation, Tim, and I don't want to put the, uh, the, the, the alliance on blast, but we were having conversations about you know, our front office needs to be, you know, more diverse. We need to have more black and brown, you know, families and uh, individuals in the C-suite. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that I said is, you know, now you realize that, you know, and I know that the teams have been working on that for a while. Um, and so, you know, I'm not being eloquent with my answer, but it's if, if not sport, then who? If not us, who? So I think we all have a responsibility not to look at it as something that's being taken away from but it's an opportunity for us to give back in such meaningful ways and, and to do so with love and light, um, you know, to Mike Taylor Roach's point. Um, and if we do that with love and light and we find that, that those things that, that bind us through sport, through community, you know, I think this world can be a much better place. And I'm hopeful that we'll get there um, and really turn this moment into a movement. Uh, that certainly made me hopeful as well as listening to all of you throughout the, the last offer, uh, the last hour rather. And, um, I often tell people, do what you can where you are. I mean, as you said, that you all have all said in different ways, a lot of people get overwhelmed by the thought of tackling such mm -hmm. immense, enormous and deeply embedded problems. And as you just said, a small gesture, people will be shocked by just mentoring one kid or just offering somebody a ride or doing something small. You'd be surprised at the kind of residual impact that that could have on somebody's life. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there for listening to this panel. They were awesome. As I said, again, you can uh, catch the recording of this on the Play Equity website. So thank you all for tuning in and for your great questions and continue to be safe out there.
Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this important uh, conversation and the first edition of the 2020 Youth Sports Summit presented by the LA84 Foundation and the Play Equity Fund. This is a critical conversation and an important moment we find ourselves in history. And throughout time, we've seen athletes using their voices and their platforms to speak out on racial inequality and to illuminate other social justice issues. So I'm hopeful that you'll join us for our next conversation scheduled on September 16th, athletes using their platforms for social justice.